Good evening. Um, I'm Professor Nancy Campbell, and I'm here to introduce our speaker. Uh, I spent the day repressing my urge to introduce Anne Svetkovich by simply quoting passages of her prose on creation and curation, militancy and melancholia, feeling and force. I think of her work as an antidote to alienation and hollow optimism, a recognition that knowledge, spirit, and words themselves issue from the body and are bound up with a sense of time and place. In the utopia of ordinary, everyday habit, to which she commends us, the practice of critique itself can be reparative. And I really need that. Sometimes I get called Nancy negativity. Um, but reading Anne Svetkovich's work makes me feel that negativity can be depathologized and made mentionable. Depression is patterned with politics and purpose in her work. It is not paralyzing or stigmatizing or meaningless, but becomes a kind of thread to a meaningful life a queer one, to be sure. Now, when people come to my office, as some of you know, even at times my home, they often depart with a reading prescription <laughs> to carry away. But even in my attempts to cure the ills that ail us with bibliotherapy, I rarely part with this book. I kind of keep it to myself in my bookcase. Um, but I do want to give you a few of Anne's words. Her prescription is for a slow and painstaking process, open-ended and marked by struggle, not by magic bullet solutions or happy endings, even the happy endings of social justice that many political critiques of therapeutic culture recommend. So I like to ponder this book. I like living with it, absorbing the craft of it and the conditions out of which it arose. This is a book about being stuck in the slew of despond, about feeling that stuckness as hopelessness and impasse and despair, but also about using the everyday craft of writing to construct, if not a utopia, a little bit more of a liv livable world, to just expand the room of what it needs to be expressed and for the possibility of pleasure, joy, and vitality. So whatever drew you here tonight, Whatever the confusing conditions of your lives, whatever might be acting up for you, Anne's work is an antidote for the toxins of our time, the fear and the doubt and the discouragement that can pervade the miry slew of despond. Whereas the Pilgrim's Progress offers no hope but Christian salvation, for the slew was such a place as cannot be mended, our speaker tonight offers us myriad ways to mend, crochet, darning, knitting, quilting, weaving, even reading. There are many tendrils to tend and many forms of joinery that enable us to discern and curate the life of sensate being in the world. We must, of course, assemble our own archives for doing that. The ephemera that hold our past and present, the traces of our ways of living, if we had thought back in the 1980s about assembling our own archives in the midst of living them in the ways that the book uh, that's shown on the screen does, perhaps we would have treated ourselves a little more kindly and one another a bit more carefully. And so I urge you to that in our present. Books, of course, cannot cure, um, but they can certainly counsel just as surely as can friends and family and lovers and pets and plants and partners and other familiars. And so when the world is too much with us, I urge you to turn to writers like Anne Svetkovich, who not only aspire to, but sometimes achieve wisdom and wholeness. What are words worth? These words flow from a scholarship of creative practice. Despite openly acknowledging that academia sometimes seem to be killing her, Anne Svetkovich seems to have found meaningful work in leading an academic life, working for decades at the University of Texas at Austin, where she was the inaugural director of LGBTQ studies, 
and now perhaps even more joyfully as the director of the Pauline Jewett Institute of Women's and Gender Studies at Carleton University in Ottawa, that's in Canada, another country. <laughs> And tonight, she speaks to us about artist curation as queer archival practice. Please join me in warmly welcoming Anne Svetkovich to our stage. That was a great intro, thank you. We're just meeting, but there is that way where one meets through books and, um, or through archives and establishes these um, often very personal relations uh, through the medium of media. Um, really happy to be here. It feels like a real treat actually to be in this amazing space. And I am thinking of what I'm doing tonight as a little bit of a, uh, license to give something more like an artist talk rather than a scholar talk. Um, and I'm just curious how many people in the audience identify as artists in some way, shape, or form? Some of you. And then how many skew towards the RPI, Science Technology Society, Engineering? Okay, okay, great. Um, I hope to be able to make those bridges. And then um, I was talking to Katie earlier who reminded me that one thing that might draw people here is the queer part. Uh, so that will surely um, be a good reason to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll see what happens. Uh, I also want to um, thank in absentia um, Ashley Farrow Murray for having invited me here and I'm really sorry she can't be here tonight. I have been greeted warmly and taken care of by the entire MPAC team. Um, so thanks to all of them. Um, and also special thanks to my friend in the audience, <laughs> Rebecca Hamilton, who's my former student who now lives here, who grew up with Ashley and um, through whom I've been connected to her. Um, and who helped me with some of the work I'm presenting tonight. So that's very special too. Uh, okay. Um, oh, let me also say before we forget, uh, I am going to be speaking to um, the sort of archive thread in what I do, but there'll be plenty of feelings there, I think. But if one of the things that brings you is an interest in hearing more about what's been happening, to my work in the aftermath of the Depression, a public feeling book. There is a little breakfast session tomorrow at 10 a.m. up in the conference room on the seventh floor in the um, MPAC offices. And you're welcome to come um, and ask questions that you might not get to ask tonight. But um, you know, feel free to take the Q&A in any direction you want if there's something you're interested in that I haven't um, addressed. Uh, but I think in some ways, too, Nancy's wonderful introduction um, makes me myself think about the way in which um, that, that book about depression was kind of hard to write. <laughs> um, maybe not as hard as living it, but, um, but in some ways also sent me to a certain kind of comfort or refuge in the archives um, that is also behind some of the work that I'm gonna describe tonight. Okay, I think that's a good little, little preamble and I'm gonna be moving between text and, um, and just showing you some of these images. Um, my opening is, uh, you know, for those of you who are not versed in high theory, it might be a little bit dry, but I'm gonna take the risk of doing that in order to set the scene for how I came to this convergence of um, archival practice and artistic practice through some questions that were rolling around inside for me, particularly in the book that I wrote before Depression of Public Feeling, which is actually there on the left, a little model of it um, called An Archive of Feelings, Trauma, Sexuality, and Lesbian Public Cultures that was an effort to 
think about questions of trauma and memory from a specifically queer perspective. I did not set out to write about archives. I came to this phrase, like, what, like how do we archive feelings? And why, particularly as um, queers, but also other minoritarian peoples, might we need to have the tools to do that? And that just has turned out to be um, a very rich vein of inquiry that has persisted for me. So I landed in the archives, or perhaps more properly in archive theory, since I was also grappling with absent archives, with people we're trying to document for whom there are not records. Um, and the work operated at the intersection of two different areas, um, trauma studies and LGBTQ studies each of which in its own way challenges what constitutes archives and how we gather and institutionalize them. Or also, even if archives is not your favorite keyword, you could just think in terms of the intersection of memory and history. Like, what do we want to preserve of the past? Also, how is it that we encounter pasts that may be very difficult, um, that we don't want to face up to? Uh, how do we do that work? And how do we recognize that work as um, not just a matter of dry history, but as um, living encounters with the past, often um, haunted pasts that, um, that are fraught with uh, questions of feeling. So trauma studies um, is grounded in the notion of an impossible archive, inspired by post-structuralist notions of the unrepresentability of traumatic experience. LGBTQ studies maintains the hope that while its archives are often absent due to homophobia and neglect, they can also be created through new modes of documentation that attend to the intimate and the everyday. My own work continues to operate in response to the tension between these two approaches to the archive, what I would call the anti-archive, which emphasizes its impossibility, and then the counter-archive, which emphasizes its not yet achieved possibility, a potential that can be realized when the archive is expanded to encompass ordinary lives, sexual practices and cultures, ephemeral experiences, and alternative institutions. And I would just say that um, maybe is also the connection to affect. Like my work often occupies um, contradictions or spaces of ambivalence, like yes, yay, archive, preserve the history, boo, archive, or fuck the archive, <laughs> you know, that it's an institution of colonialism, of patriarchy, of um, oppression. And so um, this actually is also one of the things that leads me to be very interested in questions of practice is if we occupy that um, sort of contradictory or ambivalent space, how do we move, move forward? Like, and, and that's the, also the question of the stuckness of, say, depression as impasse or everyday feeling of like, the world is overwhelming and I do not know what to do. Um, so this would be maybe a little bit more of a nerdy version of, you know, the past is haunting me. <laughs> um, and also in order to move forward, into the, the future, I need to have some way of reckoning with the past. So what is the way that I'm going to do that? Um, I'm also, this would be another bridging point um, between, say, the artists in the house and the more scientist types in the house. My interest in archive is also motivated by a long career as an interdisciplinary scholar who's often very frustrated with conventional notions of um, fact finding and evidence. And I will say this sometimes leads to me having a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about kind of science and quantitative methods at the same time as I think it's really important for us to be in dialogue with one another and to think of different ways in which we could produce um, knowledge that would be useful to us. So um, I've been really interested in the question of like what counts as evidence, especially if you are working more from uh, questions of um, intuition or hypothesis or gut feeling. So how, you know how is that a form of um, evidence and how to take it seriously? Um, and I have been bolstered there by uh, you know various of the heavy hitter theorists um, that are part of my academic training, people like Jacques Derrida, who's known for post-structuralist theory, post-colonial theorists like um, Gayatri Spivak, um, 
theorists of uh, the African diaspora and the afterlife of slavery, like um, Toni Morrison or um, Saidiya Hartman, among others. Um, so there's a lot of great theory out there that can help us with these questions. But I have also found that artists are very important. And in fact, Toni Morrison would be another example of someone who um, uses fiction in order to pursue um, deep questions of history. Um, another person who has been really important to me is um, Cheryl Dunier and her work in the film The Watermelon Woman. How many people, has anyone seen this in the audience? Good, yay. It's a classic, it's from the early 90s. I try to show it to my students all the time because um, it's just a, a beautiful piece of work both from um, the ferment of cultural production in the early 90s, um, but also I think relevant for the present. And uh, she, in the film, um, collaborated with the artist Zoe Leonard to produce a photo archive that was used in the film, but which also has had a standalone life of its own as part of uh, Zoe Leonard's um, art practice. And this is a fake archive, um, which, you know, a fake archive might be seen as a bad thing from the standpoint of truthful evidence, but in this case, it's a use of um, fiction or imagination to create an archive where none exists, and particularly in this case, uh, an imagined archive of black lesbian lives. Um, so they co concocted a story of a woman named Faye Richards who had played um, bit parts in often very racist films, but also had a lesbian life off stage. Uh, and they made these photographs that look like real photographs, you know, have a tactility and a materiality that is a reminder of different uh, modes of photography and ways that it is used to document uh, memories, both personal and collective. This piece, Faye Richards Photo Archive, I believe it's in the collection of, um, maybe of MoMA. Um, it, it, has, it is available to be seen. It's actually part of it's on display in Philadelphia right now in a uh, group exhibition that Zoe Leonard is a part of. Um, and, uh, you know, I encourage you to look out for it. Uh, to me, it's a great piece of uh, not only archival practice, but archival theory, because it teaches us something about the way in which we might need to invent archives where um, none exist. Um, so in my own work, uh, a kind of... Um, theoretical critique of the archive or skepticism of conventional institutions of libraries, museums, et cetera, um, was the thing that actually led me to the archive, although it was a, um, a, a very unusual archive, the Lesbian Herstory Archives in New York City. How many people have been to, there, to that? It's a lovely place in Brooklyn to make a pilgrimage to, to see all this stuff that's been collected in a community-based way that's not really organized as a conventional archive where things are under lock and key and you have to have a scholarly project in order to access the materials, but something that is as much a community center as it is a place to provide sanctuary for materials that relate to um, lesbian lives. So it's more like a home, you see, um, you know, pulp novels next to boots, you see uh, political buttons and stickers in the bathroom and so on. Um, and it continues to be a very lively place of, um, of research and one that's been an incredible model to me of uh, what a different kind of archive or community-based archive might um, look like. So one of the things that's happened in the maybe, you know, now probably 20 plus years since I've been thinking about archives or first visited LHA is there has been this explosion of interest in um, LGBTQ archives and um, huge amounts of collecting and moving in. I, I could not have anticipated this, but it's quite exciting. Um, you know, many universities creating collections um, or taking community-based collections and providing sanctuary for them. Uh, New York Public Library has a cute, huge collection. So I got interested in looking at what was going on, like what does it mean? Um, you know, is this uh, the arrival of you know, new visibility and possibility for LGBTQ lives? Is it another version of a kind of respectability politics like gay marriage, like okay, now we're included in the museums and um, the libraries too, again, 
uh, is this space of kind of possibility and potential, but also a space where my critical mind's going, hmm, I don't know, I want to think about that more. Um, so I have found myself uh, visiting um, various of these new um, archives finding their way into public institutions and libraries. So for the project I'm working on now, for example, I've looked um, extensively at the June Mazur Lesbian Archives, which are in um, UCLA's special collections. Uh, the collaboration between the Mazur and UCLA started out as just a digitization project where they were going to create what's called post-custodial archives where the actual materials stay with the community that, uh, with which they originate and then the digital versions are available in a research institution and it can actually be a good way in which the wealth and resource of a public institution can be used to support a more grassroots organization. Although interestingly enough, um, that collaboration led to the Mazer um, donating their physical materials to UCLA because they felt that um, they would find a good home there um, and that they could use their space for other things as well. So it's been interesting to follow that collaboration over time. Another one has been, um, Cornell University's Human Sexuality Collections, not too far from here. So, um, you know, if any of you want to take a field trip, it's a really interesting collection that has built, been built up um, since the 80s by um, the curator Brenda Marston. It's really quite amazing for um, a university to have a, like a dedicated um, curator collector who has a budget. So it's not just, oh, this stuff, you know, someone said, hey, I want to donate this stuff and gives it, but that there really is someone who's um, able to build and grow that connection. There's a lot of focus on uh, pro-sex feminisms from the 80s. Um, I've been looking at um, collections related to um, gay men of color who died of AIDS. Um, Robert Lynch is one of those men. And I, this, this slide, I'm not going to dwell, there's a lot more I could say about this collection. It's fascinating. But these are um, uh, um, slides that were donated in this pillowcase of photographs that he had taken of men he'd had sex with. Um, they're kind of an amazing collection that also occupies this interesting space of like, hmm, um, what are we to make of these materials as they find their way into a, a public space? So I've been meditating on that in the process of, and this is also where the archive is a space of a sort of intimacy and connection where um, I'm looking at the materials of these ordinary people um, and forming these bonds with them, you know, across time, across death, um, through their stuff. And so that's something that I have really wanted to think about, you know, taking up the sensibility of, say, the Lesbian History Archive, that every person's life is important. So what would it mean to acknowledge um, ordinary people through their presence in these archival connect collections? Like, what is, what is our responsibility or our accountability to um, those materials? Uh, Robert Lynch was someone who, for example, was a aspiring poet who had had, I think, very little success in having his work published. And he um, wanted this material. He knew he was dying. He wanted this material to be in an archive. And he, um, uh, uh, I think for him, it was a way for his legacy to be um, honored and respected that people could go and read those poetry manuscripts that never found their way into um, other forms of um, public presentation. Um, so it's just, it's been really fascinating to do those um, case histories and to just, um, uh, again, I think Nancy was capturing some of my interest in sort of craft and the material and uh, my interest in affect or feeling as also a kind of literal one of like, what does it mean to touch these materials and to have, um, uh, again, a relationship with them um, by, by dwelling with them or being with them. Um, so I've really tried to take that into my um, research practice. And this is where I think um, my um, archival turn, like my turn to the archive, is also part of what is sometimes called the affective turn, the turn to affect as an object of study or as a method for study, that those two things converge really interestingly in the work that I've done so far. 
So when I go to the archives, I think of it as a queer method. Uh, like, I am not going as a conventional historian. Um, and it is, I'm going with someone who mm, ha has this kind of affective relation to, to evidence. Uh, I'm thinking this would be relevant for those of you who, Nancy was telling me, there's a, um, a, a, a research-based uh, or is it practice? Uh, it, I love both of them. So practice-based um, PhD. So this is in a way my practice-based um, uh, research, which is inspired by um, artists as well. So um, one of my. So I think of this as a queer method. Uh, I think of myself as I'm also a little bit of a wannabe anthropologist. Um, you know, I've, I was trained in literary studies, so we, we deal with books and papers. But so then I think for me, it's also like, what happens when our research involves people? Um, you know, how do, how do we stage those encounters? Again, how do we make them um, respectful and collaborative, not like human subjects research? Uh, how do we build relationships with um, people and things as part of our um, research practice? Um, and so I, so I was just thinking of ethnography as the model. Like I'm going into this weird, like, I don't know, this subculture of um, an archival collection. And by thinking of it that way, I found I could more easily shuttle back and forth between the theoretical critique that just stays heavy for me. It's partly why I had to open in the way, just to remind you, like, I'm, I, I carry that. And so for me to come to material practice as someone who's trained in theory, per, sometimes produces these weird and interesting <laughs> results. Um, it's also something I feel I've done before um, with my other books. So for example, with Archive of Feelings, I was interested in the question of testimony as a form of um, public history and response to trauma. I was inspired by, for example, the um, creation of archives of um, Holocaust testimonial. And I did interviews with AIDS activists just because I wanted to see like what happens when you actually interview someone and try to talk to them and how, you know, how can I learn about that. Um, in depression, I experimented with memoir as a form of scholarly method. Um, and uh, sometimes the way I have found it useful to uh, explore a, um, a method that I might have a, a theoretical understanding of is, again, to inhabit it or to, to practice it. Um, and sometimes because my theoretical training says this is essentialist or minor, um, and I want to see how critique might produce alternative practice rather than just shutting it down by saying, no, that's you know, naive or um, that won't work. So it's also a method that's been a way of getting felt experience and sensation into the mix, not just as qualitative data, but as a new form of affective and sensory knowledge. Um, in my current project, this entails an ethnography of the archive, a look at the material practices and social practices that are part of the process of collecting, classifying, researching, and exhibiting, so as not to judge an archive simply by its institutional profile or through a static view of its collections. If the archive is a practice, not a thing, then it can be mobilized in multiple directions. Now, I just realized I was going to put this really wordy slide up that's critical questions for archive, queer archival methods, um, but I'm about to move on to the more fun part, the art part. <laughs> so I can come back to this if you want to, if that's like too much info um, uh, to, to, to pass by too quickly. Um, but this is where I get to the question of um, art practice and archival practice, um, and where I feel like my queer method gets that much queerer, that um, in looking for inspiration as someone who was not trained as an artist, um, trained as an academic, what does it mean to take up the methods of artists? I think one reason I came to this is because the often ephemeral nature of queer life necessitates a creative approach to archiving, an openness to unusual objects and collections, and an acknowledgement of that which escapes the archive. So that might be one fancy way of saying, like, like what about sex? Like, how do we archive sex? Um, the, you know, the messiness of it, the feel of it, the joy of it, uh, the pain of it, um, uh, and, um, you know, how, how would we boil that down to documents? It's like, there's got to be 
something else that we do. Um, so um, uh, documenting queer life, I think, uh, requires what Alex Juhasz has called queer archive activism, an activist relation to the archive that remains alert to its absences and that uses it to create new kinds of knowledge and new forms of collectivity. Queer archive activism insists that the archives serve not just as a repository for safeguarding objects, but also as a resource that comes out into the world to perform public interventions. Some of the best archive activists, in my view, have been artists whose creative practices and avowedly personal investments lend themselves to innovative exhibitions that bring the archive to life. So that's where we get to the um, uh, work of Tammy Ray Carlin that's been amazingly uh, present on the posters and publicity for this um, talk. And uh, this, this, was, this piece is kind of an origin for uh, my work on what I'm calling Archive of Feelings, the sequel, um, because uh, Tammy Ray, who's a friend of mine, used the title in Archive of Feelings from my book as the title for her exhibition, which consisted of um, life-size photographs of objects that had affective meaning for her. So in fact, this is a bit of a distortion of these photographs she took, as are the posters, because um, they are beautiful. Um, uh, photographs with the objects floating in a, in a white field um, and documented by virtue of her having um, re-photographed them. So this is um, Sisterhood is Powerful, a book that had meaning to her. Here's a variety of objects that came to her from her mother after she died, humble objects that are nonetheless laden with significance. And then, of course, this collection of mixed tapes that I think is just amazing as a, as a document of social networks, of you know, queer and punk um, modes of transmission of knowledge, of, um, of older methods of sharing music and um, feelings with each other through the cassette mixtape. It's a beautiful form of documenting insofar as it is, a, it is a way of moving across media to document something that exists in the realm of sound, but also exists as a material object in the, the, the cassette tape that also has designs, writing, and so on. I, I, this is, sometimes I have these touchstones, like the Faye Richards archive is one of them. Um, this image is another one that I've kind of just kept as a, as a springboard for um, the work that I am uh, continuing to do. And in fact, I, um, uh, paired this project with another one by Zoe Leonard, who did the Faye Richards archive, that's her project Analog, in which she um, documented the, the disappearing landscapes of the Lower East Side in New York by taking photos of these storefronts and objects. They don't have people in them, they are, and she builds them into series, much like um, Tammy Ray does, um, to, to, to try to preserve a world through uh, the materiality of, of, of objects. Um, this is also about spaces, about landscapes. And um, uh, there's, to me, also something important about this move across media uh, from the object to the photograph. So what does it mean to photograph an object as a way of archiving or preserving this? And of course, this is something we're doing all the time with our phones. But I think these artists are doing some interesting work around the way in which the affective power or the love you have for something might be present in your effort to try to copy or duplicate it. But that movement from the material object to the photo is very interesting to me, especially because um, photos also, I think, are very powerful as um, material objects, although again, in digital world, that's shifting around as well. So those, I'm just kind of give, taking you through some of these projects that have been um, meaningful to me as I try to think about this question of archiving or curation. You'll notice that um, they, these artists are creating collections by uh, gathering a lot of images or a lot of objects together in order to create something larger. And in some cases, I would say, yes, documenting um, people and social networks through, through these objects. Um, and I'm going to come to my friend Allison Mitchell. Uh, and. Um, uh, this is another method of preserving uh, materials, which is rather than photographing them, to draw them. So um, Allison did a project where she went to the Lesbian History Archives and she um, drew 
uh, it, actually, she photographed the books, and then she went home and drew those photographs. And I, I'm interested also in the hand uh, and the copy by hand as a kind of low-tech way. Um, I was thinking, wow, that's kind of interesting in the context of MPAC, which is all about um, access to technology. So what, it, what is, the, again, that interesting tension between the power of the hand and um, the power of the tool or the machine or the, the, the camera to be able to preserve those things that are meaningful to us. And she turned them into an amazing installation at the Art Gallery of um, Ontario uh, that um, blew them up big. Uh, you'll, let's see, yeah, here you see these, um, these big brain readers in the middle. And I love that she made a copy of my book that, and that one of them's holding it in its hand. So I've been very lucky actually to, to have this exchange with artists kind of riffing on or using my work and for example, taking a book and turning it into an, an object. Um, I was wanting to also flag um, this project because it's had another life recently in a project of Allison's called Killjoy's Castle, a lesbian feminist um, haunted house. Um, it was just in Philadelphia. I'm gonna pass around the book because I have a piece in here about the process. Can you pass this around? The process of um, performing as a Killjoy in Killjoy's Castle. So it's a lesbian feminist haunted house. People we went around to all these different um, spaces that explore uh, stereotypes of you know lesbians as monsters. It's also grappling with issues of um, uh, trans inclusion um, and uh, doing so in some kind of funny and, and powerful ways. So for example, the books reappear in this um, gender studies professor and riot ghoul dance party. So it's like, you know, here you get to like dance around with these books that might be your, your favorites. Um, Jose Munoz's uh, Cruising Utopia was a, was a favorite in the one in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, so it's also, for me, it's like what happens when a book becomes an object um, that you can hold? And um, uh, how, how is that about our affective relation to those books? Um, there's also the crypt of dead lesbian organizations, businesses, and um, ideas. Uh, and again, it's interesting to see these texts turned into um, tombstones, monuments, uh, this is, there was also a lot of archival practice here for the, uh, the version, this is in Toronto, this is a version in, in LA where they, the artists, um, Alison Mitchell and Deirdre Logue, tried to do archival research in the communities where, this, where the project was based. So in Philadelphia, they made 57 tombstones uh, of different organizations there based on archival research that they had done in Philadelphia, as well as um, working with community members in order to find out more about that community and to use the castle as a way of um, educating people about the local history. So for me as a killjoy, is a little bit like a teacher. So I would, it was interesting for me to think about, okay, how do we access queer theory through this kind of installation work um, as another way of, of you know, getting people to, to know um, about clubs, about um, bars, about, um, fly-by-night organizations and so on. Okay, I am gonna run out of time really fast. Um, let's see, I um, wanna do a couple of things and I wanna try to finish in the next 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, just quickly, um, I will take you through Her Street Inventory, which is another way of um, an artist using Again, Lesbian History Archives as a, um, a site of curatorial practice. Um, Ulrika was really fascinated by this very dry list of descriptions of t-shirts in the collection. T-shirts are a big uh, feature of, um, of uh, lesbian archives and um, uh, our, our queer archives, you know, the t-shirt, the political button and so on. And she gave these out as drawing assignments to people. So they didn't get to see the actual t-shirt, they just saw the list. Um, I love that people are laughing. It turns out actually that I met the people who made this list who said, oh yeah, we were kind of joking amongst ourselves, like we're supposed to be doing this serious task of logging these t-shirts, but we're gonna you know, put a little humor in it. 
Um, and uh, so it produced results like this, inverted triangle with flames on top of it. Um, <laughs> Kind of a nice, you know, for those of you who might feel ambivalent about the rainbow or the pink triangle, like all kinds of amazing things happen with that iconography in the hands of these different artists. And um, importantly for me, for where we want to go or where we want to land with the talk tonight, is that um, she really wanted to make an intervention into existing institutions. So she collected 100 drawings. Um, that were displayed in various ways. There's also a lovely book that Dancing Foxes Press put out that includes all the drawings. But um, the peak moment was the installation of the drawings in the Brooklyn Museum in um, various interstitial places in the museum and co-curated with objects. So she was thinking about the triangle, like the pink triangle, but also the triangle as an abstract form. And she, because there, she tried to put in lesbian as a search term, for the Brooklyn Museum and nothing came up. Um, so she's like, OK, I'm going to have to get creative here. Uh, and so she just started looking for triangles and rainbows and um, axes. I'm wearing my labrys tonight. Uh, and, um, and coming up with the, some interesting uh, mechanisms for uh, kind of queering up the uh, collections such as they were. Um, in the Brooklyn Museum. And this is something I'm really interested in is, you know, how can these uh, queer curatorial practices shift um, our sense of the museum, not just become, oh, here's my personal art practice in a gallery, but here, here is a staging of an intervention that can transform our public institutions. Um, so that, I'm going to make a, let's see, I'm going to stop there. These are the actual t-shirts. She did an a, a archival edition of, of some of them. Um, and I, I, I have a longer piece about this where I talk about um, the way in which having so many drawings is also a kind of a dem, uh, what I'm calling a, like a democracy of the hand, where everyone can make a drawing. Everyone can be part of this collection. And the result is a different kind of artistic display or public history or museum. So one of the things I've been thinking about as I do this project, and I've just moved back to Canada after many years away, and I'm really interested in what is going on with um, indigenous resurgence and um, decolonization in, um, in Canada. Really interested in the way this is playing itself out in the context of museums and libraries. Um, Indigenous people, you know, like many racialized peoples, have often had a very um, uh, contested relation to museums where they have been collected, dissected, studied, um, rendered as scientific subjects, and so on. Um, so again, it raises the issue of should we just like smash the museum, <laughs> smash the stage, or uh, try to do something else with it? Um, and uh, so, for example, one thing that's um, become common practice in Canada is land acknowledgement. I was asking someone about who are the traditional peoples of these lands that we're on. So um, actually, this part of upstate New York is not so far, especially if you don't, uh, if, uh, you don't think about borders from, from Canada. So my understanding is that we are on lands of the Haudenosaunee and also Mohican peoples. And, um, so just that is a kind of decolonial history lesson of, of, of learning the, the history of the land we're on, that as settlers, as I am, we are guests on that land, and that um, in a, people are trying to figure out how to make land acknowledgment not just a gesture, but something meaningful. So what would it mean to be accountable to those histories and to begin to learn the, the layers of these landscapes, like this one here, so profound, the Hudson River, um, you know, to learn those waterways um, and to learn the, 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 the histories, both, you know, the bloody histories and the, um, the, the creative histories of lands, um, both uh, pre and post um, European contact. So Kent Monkman um, is a Canadian artist, queer and indigenous, whose uh, work has been really interesting to me and who um, did this amazing show uh, um, in 2017, which was the 150th um, anniversary of the founding of Canada as a nation, or the sesquicentennial. So um, Kent Monkman felt like it wasn't really a moment 
of celebration for Indigenous peoples, that actually the uh, 150 years of Canadian nationhood had been some of the worst uh, years in the history of, of Indigenous peoples on that land. Um, and invited, he was invited to curate something at the University of Toronto Galleries and produced what I think is an amazing exhibition that I want to just show you a few um, pieces from, um, and then we will stop there. I'm not going to have time to do full justice to this, but I just, um, I kind of want people, how many, are any of you familiar with this work? One or two. Okay, so part of it is also, you know, across borders, like I want people to know about this work and also to be thinking about um, ways it might serve as a model. So central to Monkman's strategy um, is his dual role as artist and curator and the juxtaposition of his own um, artwork in a variety of media. He's known for these uh, um, uses of landscape and history painting that are very beautifully um, queer. Um, and uh, he co-curated his own work with um, work from institutions. I actually first became familiar with his work because it was featured on the cover of the journal GLQ that I um, edited. And so we were able to take this um, color painting and reproduce it on the cover of the journal. But it was um, also a bit of a fight because this is the image that the editors wanted to have on the cover that is a kind of image of, um, of colonization and responses to colonization through um, sexuality. And I was shocked that our editors at Duke University Press, even my dear friend who was helped facilitate the publication of my book, said we could not have this on the cover because we could not have dicks and butt fucking. So um, this is where I think um, uh, Monkman's work really is uh, kind of pushing up against um, certain kinds of conventions for representation. So I've been really interested to see him take that sensibility and move it out into um, public space. So it leads to things like this retake on this famous um, image in uh, Canadian national history of the founding of the nation through the Fathers of Confederation. Um, Monkman calls it um, the daddies. Uh, and um, he's able to bring into play his um, his alter ego, who is um, Miss Chief Eagle Testicle, that's her in the, in the foreground there on the Hudson's Bay blanket. Um, so she appears as a time traveler throughout the exhibition, a two-spirit high femme angel of history who injects humor and camp aesthetics where there is much sadness. This queer indigeneity is central to Monkman's process, liberating him to move across genres, times, and affective registers to create um, a new kind of museum. Um, so I think I will just flip to one example. We can come back to these. He's done really interesting work with the um, residential school history. So it, this, this is an exhibition that's very shrewd, I think, affectively for working with um, joy and, um, and violence uh, together. Um, but especially, I, I want to just dwell on this take on the diorama um, because, uh, OK, on one version of this talk I gave, I realized at the end that some people didn't know what a diorama is. So to, to, do I need to explain? Or it's like a genre of museum exhibition that's been much maligned as actually playing into a kind of scientific specimen relation to animals and to um, indigenous peoples, African peoples. In fact, Monkman jokes about going to the Museum of Natural History, thinking that it would be about plants and animals and being like, why are people in the Museum of Natural? Like, is this what you think about uh, um, indigenous peoples? So I think a lot of people have felt like the diorama is a, a genre that cannot be rescued or should not be rescued. And um, part of what I want to argue is that it's through his relation to queer aesthetics and camp and performance that um, Monkman is able to uh, refunction um, the diorama in some pretty cool ways. So this is called Scent of a Beaver. It's from the first chapter of, uh, of, the, um, of, of Shame and Prejudice uh, that explores New France, the early history of Canada before it was Canada when it was predominantly occupied by the French and specifically the um, relation between uh, the 
uh, two, there's a famous battle in the Plains of Abraham in 1759 where the uh, British leader Wolfe squared off against the French leader Montcalm. They actually both died, and it was a pivotal moment in the um, transformation of Canada from a largely French uh, country to a British one. Um, so what Monkman has done is to take this Fragonard painting and, in a sense, indigenize it and queer it up. He's, um, so Wolfe and Montcalm are situated as these suitors of um, actually an uh, indigenous woman, and he's playing all the parts. And I just love that kind of two-spirit shifting of um, gender, of race, where he takes over. Um, OK. Um, he also does uh, really interesting things with the vitrine. So this is a piece called Starvation Table, where he curated China from the um, uh, uh, collections of various institutions. But he also made um, made these um, starvation plates out of these archival images of buffalo bones. These are, I don't know, a little bit kin to lynching photos, I think, these bones of um, these animals that are in an, in an archive. I kind of went down a rabbit hole of what does it mean to take these images and put them on a plate, and how does that allow us to reframe the destruction and violence that is at the heart of these images, which can be quite difficult to look at, and yet are quite present in the archive. And in fact, um, when I tried to figure out where they were, it turned out they're just readily available online. They just like pop up. Um, so I've been wanting to ask myself, what does it mean for Monkman to be able to um, find them and um, these documentary images and to be able to, again, move them across media from the photograph to the plate that has a kind of material culture to resituate them in relation to things like this image of Queen Elizabeth and to use that as a way to have us think about um, these histories and encounter them. Um, so it, it's an amazing show. It's actually making its way across Canada now and um, and it's going to end at the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver next spring. So if you happen to be in Vancouver, you could see it there. Quite amazing that it will be at the Museum of Anthropology, which is a renowned museum, actually, for having taken indigenous arts and making them um, more, uh, well, pumping them up, but, uh, but also in a way that sometimes does feel a, uh, a bit appropriative and that still keeps them in museum space. So I'm interested to see him in that context. But I also wanted to close by um, highlighting or flagging the fact that he's doing, uh, he's been commissioned to do a big installation of two giant paintings in the entry hall of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. That those are going to go up on display uh, in December and will be up through April. So if that's a place you're able to get to regularly, I think it'll be really interesting to see him um, take over that space. And uh, I think it will also contribute to um, his visibility in the US. Uh, and also, I think, perhaps open up um, discussions that could be very interesting here about um, encounters between indigenous histories and other important histories in the US, the history of slavery and its aftermath, histories of migration and so on. I think uh, we're just seeing a really interesting time for um, public memory um, and the, the role of, of, of artists and creative thinkers. I think all of sort of, I th see it as a huge multidisciplinary effort to think about how we can transform these um, institutions in ways that you know, honor these um, uh, often very violent pasts and the kinds of feelings that continue to circulate about them. So I think I'm going to close there. Thank you very much. And, um, and we will have time for some questions. Thank you. And you can ask me anything. You can also comment. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm here for you, <laughs> live. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for such an awesome talk. I'm super interested in your work because I work in archives where, unfortunately, most of my the material I only deal with text, like government transcripts that not only 
art in general are problematic, but also like are completely stripped of any kind of variance besides words on the paper. So being able to do mm. like see more of this work methodologically, I'm really interested in the idea of querying methods when I'm not looking at photographs, we're not looking at dioramas, but rather like when, when the only thing that has been preserved is text. Mm. And how do we reconcile that in our practice when like when it's almost not easier, but like it, it's when I'm engaging in art that I can feel like I'm doing something that's queer when mm -hmm. I'm engaging in this more scholar, mm. official archive, I feel like it's really hard to enter that space mm -hmm. with that, like as a, in the forefront. Yeah. It seems like something that's sidelined, so. Yeah. What's the collection you work in? Um, I, funnily enough, a lot of it's even digital. So I'm primarily looking at FDA hearings and transcripts uh, from the 1960s to now, but also just at all, like work, like whether it's an academic organization with congressional hearings, usually the only thing that I find, even from the 90s and 2000s, are agendas, um, transcripts, and if I'm lucky, some PowerPoints. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a great question because it really speaks to, you know, so how, how would one take this work or this sensibility and, and can you take it with you into those kinds of spaces or that kind of project? And I'm wanting to take that seriously as an issue. So you're right to point out the way in which, you know, a lot of conventional archives, especially if we think about the archive as, first of all, about the, the state and its keeping of records. Um, and so sometimes people get a little, like even professional archivists, get a little annoyed about the sort of loose use of the term archive here, but I, I stand by it as a way of creating a broad umbrella that would allow us to link um, something like organizational records with the other kinds of things that find their way into people's um, personal collections and then also into, into institutions. So it's well, one thing that's become a really important category for me is ephemera, is, is looking for the places where it's not text or where so, some kind of object materiality kind of often like sneaks into the archive. Um, so I've done a lot of work I, at University of Texas, for example, where the Harry Ransom Center collections are housed, which is a lot of famous um, artists and writers and so on. And there is a sort of convention to how those materials are usually organized, where it will be um, the manuscripts first and then the correspondence. And then you kind of get to the weird miscellaneous, like doesn't quite fit. And sometimes that is also where you find the personal effects or the solid objects. And a lot of times the archive kind of wants to, um, you know, sideline those, like they come at the bottom of the finding aid. Um, and oftentimes they are just obligated to take them and figure out something to do with them because if someone gave them their collection, they have to keep it. So I've just been trying to track that, like, with, like those interstitial spaces. Um, sometimes I describe it as working backwards, like starting from the stuff that seems the most insignificant in the collection and moving forward. Um, but, uh, but that too then can give you a different kind of sensibility when dealing with what look to be more fusty, musty, dry records. Uh, so, I, so that too has been an interesting direction of inquiry for me. So, uh, for example, with uh, my interest in kind of indigeneity in the archives in Canada, I've gone to the National Archives there and looked at the records of the records and uh, just p poured through, like looking, looking for the indigenous presence in the archive. And in fact, I'm very inspired by work on the afterlife of slavery, like um, Morrison Hartman and others. Like what, it, what, is, what is the, this was Morrison's question for Beloved, like what was the felt experience of slavery from the standpoint of the slaves when we have only these records? And so I think, you know, one of the things that's become a, a very um, important or precious object in trying to track the absent archive of, say, the Middle Passage have been these um, records of cargo um, that are effectively, you know, deeply disturbing and, and charged. So beginning to then also be able to read records as evidence of lives, um, of flesh, of violence, I think is another way to go. It's, it's, 
it's taken it's taken me a longer time to get to that, but I I have found interesting stuff that way, and again inspired by I think other folks doing that work. Or uh, I've been really interested in well, this is this is say Morrison's project in Beloved is is to, this fragment of a record of. Um, the, the slave Margaret Garner, which actually inspired by Morrison, so many people have come after her and been able to find so much more uh, out about, about Margaret Garner, about the context in which she um, lived and moved. So I think we're seeing kind of amazing forms of um, capacity to be able to take archival fragments and then do things with them that both um, uh, that, that move between absence and presence in some really powerful ways. Thank you for that question. That was good. Yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, yeah, I'll get you after. That's well, fine. That's good. Um, I've been like spending a lot of time thinking about um, the work that's going on in the Russian archives, um, mm -hmm. trying to find evidence of um, deviant sexuality, homosexuality, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Um, and then relating that kind of to what's going on now with, um, you know, we saw with the Olympics, um, this kind of condemnation of Russia and we're doing better here and this call for kind of visibility politics, which then a lot of people who are there on the ground, that doesn't work for them. It's mm -hmm. a, a sort of imposition, right? So when we think about um, those relationships historically and in the present, um, I've just been thinking a lot about legibility. Um, you know, over time and um, whether it doesn't work for someone or not to put out something that um, would be legible outside of a certain circle of, of people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot about my own experience and how, you know, some, when I go to places like the Lesbian History Archives, I think about, oh, you know, I've ha had so many experiences where we didn't take any photographs or we didn't want to break from what we were doing to, to record something. And then actually it's, it's, Secret, secretiveness from the world actually mm -hmm. preserves what that experience mm -hmm. was. Um, so how, I don't know, do, yeah. you know, how do these things factor into your work? And, and yeah, those are definitely good questions that I also think about in a way, you know, this project is a big compendium that's sort of inviting conversation with people who might be working in different collections, different contexts, and how is it that we would, you know, build capacity to be able to speak to one another across different cases. Um, it's interesting the term legibility, right? That's an interesting one um, since it carries the double meaning of both uh, like legible, readable that takes us back to print culture and then legible, like understandable. So I think it's good to slow down and think about what it is that we are trying to accomplish when we're um, studying or building relations with um, you know, across, say, borders or contexts. I found it, I kind of imagine some version of like a comparative archival studies where we would, you know, look at different kinds of collections. The, the, the tight relation between the nation and the archive is really interesting. And then also um, the refusal to be documented, I think, always has to be taken seriously um, as another strategy by which people have kind of preserved themselves, but perhaps not for the benefit of others. Um, so in this work, I, I have found it, you know, continually to be thought provoking around where um, sort of alternative modes of, um, of creating knowledge for the purpose of sustaining lives of various kinds, but it's up against kind of the standard practices of the academy. And it's like, how can we, how can we do that in some ways that might be might be different. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I was really struck by this idea of movement across media. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I was thinking of one of the, uh, as a musician, is one of the things that ends up happening a lot as like music has both like the practice and also the scripted form that can take multiple forms, whether that's tablature or actual scores and how different all of those are and how that's interpreted. Like, and I, I think a lot of um, in the early 2000s, all of the punk, pop punk covers of pop songs mm -hmm. and also like Richard Cheese that does a lot of covers of like heavy metal songs and things like that, which is like into easy listening form. Mm -hmm. and how both funny tongue in cheek and also 
subversive all of these things are and like um, reaching different audiences. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was wondering whether, um, one, you've had any engagement with music as well and how like artists might be using music as a manner of movement across media in a way that isn't visual or might be exclusively visual if they're doing it through tablature and scores and whether maybe music theory might have something interesting to say about this topic. Yeah. I, uh, again, mostly through um, actually teaching and working with students who are working on questions of music and sound, um, I found it to be another rich area of cross-fertilization. Uh, you're right that there's a whole talk I could give that's just about this question of crossing media um, and sound and also performance would be part of that. Uh, dance as well, like how to uh, dance and, and music both can be kind of difficult to archive in conventional ways. I have found it interesting to uh, butt up against the limits of, say, paper documents going back to that. But since they're so obviously not the thing, like how, how can they function, the, the scores or uh, the um, evidence of a performance in the form of like programs or other ephemeral material um, because it's a reminder that you never have the full archive anyway so how is it that you could uh, bridge the gap between sound and print through these print materials that said I do think um, this is where um, we were talking about like I don't know, arts of sensory engagement or uh, you know that I taught a class that was called um, uh, archiving the senses. I was trying to put together questions of sense perception as they're going on in affect theory and questions of the archive. And uh, so there uh, we did kind of interesting exercises like just listening and, and writing. I've, I've become interested too in, this would be the ethnography part, like what can be the status of writing as a way of documenting, you know, sensory experiences that far exceed the page. Uh, and so that's where, again, I find very interesting conversations with people who are working with music or, or sound. Like, what does it mean to tune in, literally, to the soundscape um, and, uh, and use that as, as a way into um, other kinds of documentation? There's really interesting work, actually, on, on uh, questions of indigeneity and land. So what does it mean to, like, listen to land or have a sensory engagement? with it as one way of coming to know what it is that um, land might teach us. Um, so that's another place where sound has been kind of coming onto my screen. But again, I, it's why I like to do this work to just like, you know, riff on different things with people who might be working in other contexts. Others? Yeah, back there and then we'll come down here. Yeah. How do you feel about archiving, again, the another sensory thing, which is touch? Like the, the conversation mm -hmm. of how do we archive touch? How do we archive these uh, sensory things that are not very archivable in some ways? Uh, what, is, what is your ways to describe that experience? Do you always rely on your... Uh, rely on verbal communication or? Um, yeah, that's, uh, it is the sort of humble tool that I have at my disposal, um, but it's not like I'm gonna stand by that as the only way to do it. Like this is again where I think, you know, artists who have a multimedia practice might be, obviously could do some very cool things with questions of, of the touch or the haptic. Um, but it is where even just moving between, I've been doing some work moving between, say, um, this notion of the photograph of the object, because I found following Carland and um, Zoe Leonard and others that I too was in, in the archive taking photographs of, of objects. Sometimes those objects were text-based objects, but I was understanding them as material. And then, and then being able to work from that image to um, to some kind of writing or text, and often trying to capture the 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 the, the sensory experience of touching the documents, being in the archive, being in, embodied in space, um, and I just 
uh, just been practicing with what can I do in writing, um, recognizing that as just one um, possible medium. But I think there are a lot of interesting experiments in writing, including kind of ethnographic writing right now that are coming into play as people are reckoning with um, other forms of media as well. So it's sort of a time of these interesting um, uh, engagements across media, even if one is, is working pretty strongly within, say, one medium like, like writing. Um, again, I think it's about, about sort of discussion and dialogue across, across the differences. So I look with interest on um, other mechanisms by which people try to, um, uh, say, archive sensory experience. So I think someone here, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for this amazing talk. Uh, so I basically work on radiation contamination and I gently, I look at the sensorial aspects of radiation contamination, oh. how it is sensed yeah. and it is never reproducible in a lot of ways. So giving, giving you that context, my question was, you said that um, when archiving is a practice, it allows you to mobilize in different ways. Yet, mobile, while mobilization is one thing, I also want to know how if, you know, mobilization can be, can formalize feelings into archives is where, like, you were sort of getting at mm -hmm. also. But I'm interested in how archive practice are allowed to mutate into life forms or mm. multiple sensate bodies in a way that even, th even this entire relationship that I have with the images that you're showing with to us is... It's very much optical, and yeah. I I yeah. don't know what it is to be there. Uh, uh, so this institutionalization of sight can queer uh, archiving practice, you know, be a sensorial synesthesia against this, you know, fragmentation of sight being predominant in museum cultures. Yes. Yeah, now, now you're, yeah, this is great. You're refracting on into another direction. Maybe this would be the conversation um, to have in and around, say, people doing, are you, are you doing STS work? Yes, or, yes. Okay, so yes, I, and again, I've had, it's been a kind of interdisciplinary conversation when I've had a chance to engage with people who are, who are doing that work, which I can't claim for myself at all. And in fact, it would be one of my dreams for these conversations around method. Um, so reframing the museum would just be, I mean, it's a huge thing, but it's like the, the piece that I can, um, you know, track. But I am thinking, um, or what I would love to see, and this maybe comes into play most in my capacity as a, uh, like a graduate supervisor, like mentoring different projects. I kind of have this dream of, of creating these more, and STS is sort of that, like an attempt to do um, studies in a, in a different way, that that would be one of the stakes of this issue is like how, yes, how would you track yeah. uh, radiation or toxicity and what, what would be like, yeah, what would be the research method yeah. for that? that might also bring some of this sensibility into that world. Um, and how to also do it in a way that's going to, you know, get you funded. <laughs> like, get, you know, that doesn't just seem like wacky fringe or something. So for me, this is actually why the archive has been a kind of a stealth mode for me, because archives are respected. <laughs> um, so if I can, you know, Call call my work like to like this is kind of the like I'm trying to figure out how to do a post depression project but it always feels like basically it, right now it's about I want to write about uh, mental health in our institutions caretaking resilience and survival it's just about like how to live like that's a <laughs> research project and I feel like the archive is a little bit my alibi of like how you know. I'm doing some serious stuff, like going to collections and looking at things and, um, and give me some money to do that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it does track back to these affective questions. So I am interested in kind of thinking with grad students about how they can work those spaces to, um, you know, come up with a project that's 
going to be legible, to go back to that idea, um, but still pushes around the question of like, what is knowledge anyway? And like, yeah. why do we want to have it? Um, and uh, that, that is also like one of my, you know, ambitious, like, interests or desires with some of this work. I'll come, I'll come to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it usually has to be collaborative, right? Like, I can't, you know, it's like an engagement with like, what are you trying to do? How are you doing it? You know, let's try to make it work. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad for these programs, like, some, I know, well, I'm not going to go down the path of SDS because I don't know what I'm to talk about. But I Who else? A couple more? Yeah, a couple more back there. Um, Hi, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I'm one of the archivists here at the oh. Institute. And, you know, it, it is an institutional archive. So yeah. we're a bit on the traditional side. Most of the collection is white male history. Yeah. Um, but, you know, over the past 30 years, we've been collecting a lot of diverse collections, especially uh, student history collections. But I'm curious if you have had um, relationships with archivists where you have discovered something that was maybe whitewashed and it, you know, maybe you engaged with an archivist to get a collection uh, a little more elevated or seen, something that wasn't um, obvious to them in an institutional setting? Um. Uh, yes, I think I have, but it's but it but actually, what's popping into my mind right now is two things. One, uh, those institutional archives I do think are very important as a way of exploding the space, right? To possibly be used to tell alternative stories, um, and it could be through the hyper visibility of kind of whiteness and um, money and all of that. It could be through finding um, more covert or hidden things. Um, I just saw a brilliant example, or heard about a brilliant example of this as it happens um, the night, well, like two days ago. Um, you can look up on the web, a, a Toronto-based artist, um, Deanna Bowen, who was commissioned actually by the same curator, I haven't met her, but she sounds amazing, Barbara Fisher at University of Toronto, who commissioned Kent Monkman to do the um, Shame and Prejudice Project, and um, she did a, um, a display around the founder of this theater at, on the University of Toronto campus that's just a bastion of kind of white elitism, um, and one of the dudes involved with that, founding that theater wrote this play called God of Gods that's like full of racist blackface, she basically just, she said, I did not have to work that hard to find this stuff. It's right there. And then she made this exhibition out of um, those materials. And uh, so I, I, I know that's not directly an answer to your question, but I think for me, it's um, another kind of interesting dimension of this is there's both trying to bring other kinds of materials into our institutions, but there's also working with the ones that are there where these stories are kind of hiding in plain sight if we curate them differently. And it is important. Like right now, you know, the US is doing a huge work of, of kind of uh, exploring its, uh, um, the racism of academic institutions, like the, the, you know, the dirty story of how they got, got founded. And um, that's a kind of archival research that might seem, again, very dry, but is also like rich with, um, with, with stuff. <laughs> I think behind you, yeah. Yeah, I was, thank you for this. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what feels like a move from public history or oral history in an archive of feelings into memoir or mm. personal narrative, and whether that, whether you recognized your depression diaries as archive, and whether that was helped yeah. to push back against some of the anti-memoir sentiment. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, because in both cases, both memoir and an oral history about are about personal narrative. 
uh, which has been central to, for example, a lot of feminist methodology. And uh, interest, it was interesting for me actually to find myself in art. It's also just counterintuitive in a way for me to go so deeply into archival work because from that er earlier in interest in oral history, that, that was kind of a move against the archive. Like we're not gonna find what we want there. We have to keep engaging with live people. And I'm also aware of ways in which um, archival research can sometimes protect from having to, to, to deal with real people. So it's like always trying to keep that in the, in the mix. Um, but I, I've had interesting conversations as well with um, archival uh, scholars, also working on, like one of them's um, Juana Maria Rodriguez, who's done work on um, HIV AIDS activism and culture as well, who's talked about sort of the relief of turning to the archive when having to deal with the messiness of the infighting and the stories people don't want to tell and so on. Like it can be really hard work. So moving, that's another place where I kind of go for a both and, like moving between um, archival documents and live people and moving, and also um, keeping, keeping all that's important to me about personal narrative, whether oral history or, or memoir, that remains deeply important to me, but, um, but trying to figure out how to do that work in some different ways as well, um, so as to, to pull the um, intimate histories and the public histories together. So I think that's gonna, whatever shape the written book that this project is about takes, I think will end up trying to weave those kinds of things together. Like some of my accounts of my Archival research are, are very personal, um, but I'm trying to have that also make meaning in a, in a broader way too. So uh, yeah, I just continue to think about, about those, those writing genres for sure. All right, I'm, yeah, we're almost at 7.30. So one final, are you, are you? No, Oh, okay. Oh, no, I was signaling there's only five minutes left. Yeah, so we can take maybe, maybe a lightning round of anybody urgent, and then you're also, uh, you know, welcome to mix and mingle after. And then there is, if you're interested, there is this further discussion at 10 a.m. tomorrow upstairs. So, yes. So, um, oh, sorry. Go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I was really excited to hear you, uh, like, mention that fake archive from the Watermelon Woman, and then also say it was good because I have um, had this experience of putting together a fake archive once, and mm. it, was just, it was a really, uh, like, queerly romantic experience. Like, I was making up this person who I found didn't find an archive with someone else, and uh, I was really, like, falling in love with this historical figure. It felt like really mm. deep work, and I found myself really doing a lot of, like, making up stories about why this was important. Um, and being really confused about what kind of work the fake archive I was constructing could do. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you just, if you had other thoughts on the importance of the fake archive, um, the kind of work you can do with that. Um, I think I would just refer you to, um, to Saidiya Hartman, mm -hmm. um, uh, including her new book, Wayward Lives, uh, and also um, Tavia Nyong'o, in his book on Afrofabulations. Um, and he's, he's drawing on Hartman's notion of critical fabulation. So I think it is important to reckon with, again, the tension between the, the fictive archive and the absent archive in order to guard against what can be a, um, a romanticization of the fake archive that, that kind of covers over the gaps that it was intended to address. So yeah, I think your question's coming from a place of like, you know, wanting to, again, inhabit kind of modes of tension and contradiction around that practice. Yeah, back there. Um, I'll just be quick. Jump off of that point. I was thinking when you showed the um, collage pieces from the two artists um, of Instagram, actually, and how similar as a, a format those pictures are are laid out. Oh yeah. Um, and so yeah. I was thinking, like, 
have you come across work of people using social media as a form of art, personal archive? Um, and then for, this is kind of maybe related or not, but just for you personally, how has your work in this realm um, shaped your relationship to your personal objects? <laughs> and <laughs> whether or not you, you know, you, uh, Save things differently now, or look at things differently now in a personal. Uh, that will have to wait for tomorrow. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, having just moved my entire world um, from one place to another, um, deeply difficult work. But yeah, the Instagram thing again, mostly through working with students doing projects of that kind. Although we'll just say I'm very interested building off of the Carlin and the. Um, Leonard in, um, in, in seriality, like a serial practice of collecting that's over time and for me is a way of, of documenting the everyday of like c collecting small things over, over time and uh, yes, yeah, so I'm very interested in that issue as well. I think we should stop there. <laughs> oh yeah, is the Killjoy's Castle book out there somewhere? Because it's my only copy, so be sure to bring it back. Thank you. All right, that was a great Q&A session. Thank you so much. Um, yeah.